we're going to be looking this morning at a text that uh, is somewhat controversial uh, and somewhat difficult. But I want to start with something that we can kind of get to a point where we can get into the text. By the way, my, my whole sermon, and we're going to look at other texts, but my whole goal is to get you to understand one verse. Okay? And um, there's some verses that are they're so confusing that it takes a little bit of time to really let them sink in. So, so anyway, one verse is the goal. In fact, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to John chapter 14 in your own Bible if you have it. Because we're going to be there a lot, and um, I want you to see it in the context. We'll go from there. But I will start here with this picture. This is a guy. Uh, some of y'all, who knows who this is? Anybody? Ready? Okay, you know who is it? Uh, George Washington is a great guest, but no, he's one of those other father guys. Uh, but great guess, great guess. This is actually a guy named Thomas Jefferson. And he, he wasn't the first president, but he was, I think, the third president, right? Third president of the United States. So wait, where's Aniston when I need her? She's new on all this stuff. Anyway, um, yeah. But anyway, uh, he was one of our founding fathers. And there's one thing interesting about Jefferson. I don't know if you know this or not. Jefferson had some very different views, uh, some interesting views about God. And uh, now, now he didn't do this trying to republish God's word or warp it. But, but he, he had a belief and a trust in God, but he didn't necessarily believe in certain aspects of the Bible. And so this is a picture. This is actually, you could go to Smithsonian today. You could see the Bibles that he cut and pasted from before he had computers where you cut and paste. So you actually had to take scissors and cut and paste, you know, physically. And so anyway, but for his own personal reflection... Uh, in thinking about his role as a leader, he went through the Bible and he cut and pasted certain things out, out of the Bible to edit it how he felt like was appropriate. Now, I don't necessarily, I don't recommend doing this, uh, but, but he, he had a view that, that anything, that the Bible is a great source of morality and of teaching and of understanding, but as far as the divinity or the supernatural or even the resurrection story, he just wasn't so sure about that. And so... So this is one something he, he, he published for the world to see, but for his own personal reflection, he actually took and cut and pasted Bibles. Um, and, and they named this uh, the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth was kind of his thing. So it told the story of Jesus uh, and it stole, told kind of his teaching and his morals. But he didn't necessarily um, buy into the entire Bible, which sounds really crazy. I mean, especially if you grew up in a church where you've taken the Bible as God's word and you've honored it as God's word and you've been taught it as God's word. But what I think is interesting about this is that this practice of, of taking, I, I don't know anyone that cuts and pastes out of their Bible, but the practice of taking and focusing on some scriptures while excluding others is common, when I'm honest, throughout churches, in, including ours. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not totally condemning it. And the reason why I'm not is because we all have our favorites. I mean, some of you uh, like eating at Taco Bell. Well, some of our young people like eating at Taco Bell. Some of them get sick of it because that's where we go on Wednesdays because it's convenient and it's close. And I kind of like it, you know. But, um, but we all have our favorites. We all have our preferences. So there's passages that mean something to us that we hold on to, that we memorize, the ones that come to the top. And, and it's nothing wrong with having preferences. And there's also passages that, honestly, maybe they're not actually appropriate as you're thinking about the context of where you're teaching or reading to present. You know, there's some things that I would talk to adults about that I wouldn't talk to, you know, third graders about because of where they're at developmentally. Uh, and so I don't necessarily condemn totally having favorites, but I do want to say there's a caution when it comes to God's word of skipping over things that are rather confusing or difficult or that don't line up well with our view of things, okay? And so to this morning, we're going to look at one of those passages that I believe fits into there. I'm, I'm not trying to say more Bibles are more important, um, but, but I am saying, I think when I'm honest, there's some things that in growing up in the context of a church of Christ throughout my entire life, there's passages that I've never heard taught. And this is one of those, okay? This passage right here, and I would be curious, I'm not going to do this, but I'd be curious if any of you have ever heard this Quoted or taught in a sermon in the churches you've been a part of. Um, I'm, if you have afterwards, I, I'd be curious because I have not. Uh, but this one passage uh, in the context of John chapter 14 is one 
that it's easy to breeze over. And as Mark was going through, systematically been going through John, this is sort of where it came to. And it's the passage I want to deal with this morning. So the goal is to get and understand one passage. Actually, it's not really, doesn't seem really hard. The words aren't difficult to understand. But what does this really mean? And so here's our passage. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works because I am going to be with the father. Um, and, and let's let's get the context of this. And that's why I'm glad for you guys that have your Bibles open that you can see and look what's going on in the Gospel of John. OK, before before we get to this passage earlier that week, Jesus has come with a triumphal entry into town. He's marching this processional. People are praising him as Lord. Uh, they've got the palm leaves. And then from there, um, he is talking to them. And this is in John chapter 12. He talks to them about, hey, I'm, I'm going to be going somewhere. Where I'm going, you can't follow. I mean, he's, he's really setting up for something different is about to happen. And so, so the disciples kind of get concerned because they've been following him for three years of their life. Everywhere he goes, they've been following him. And he's like, okay, you can't really follow me now. Uh, and then he goes through this thing of washing the disciples' feet, again, which is unheard of for a master, a teacher, a rabbi, to wash the feet of his followers. And then Peter, if you remember the story, Peter's like, oh, man, there's no way I'm letting you wash my feet. And Jesus says to Peter, unless I wash you, you don't have any part of me. And then, and then so he rebukes Peter once, and then Peter says, well, okay, give me a whole bath. Because I want to be, if that's the case, I want to be washed by you. And, Peter's like, and Jesus is like, no, you're missing it still. I'm not giving you a whole bath. Uh, so anyway, but there's a level of confusion about what's going on and what's happening. And then at the meal they have at the last supper, Jesus says something crazy. Like one of you guys is going to betray me. And they're not like, oh, it's that guy. They're like, uh, is it me? I mean, I mean, so there's, there's a level of confusion as we get into John chapter 14 among his followers about what is going on with Jesus. So that's why he starts out in 14 verse 1. It says, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. For in my father's house are any mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you. Because where I am, that's where I want you to be also. And so, so he starts in John chapter 14 telling them, preparing them. Hey, I know it's confusing, guys. I know it's frustrating. But this is what is about to happen. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so we get down to John chapter 14 here where he says this confusing thing. Um, oh, yeah. Let me say this. Philip, this is right before this. And John, I think it's verse 8 of chapter 14. But Philip says, Jesus says, uh, somebody asked, hey, show us the Father. Where, where is God? Show us God and that's going to be enough for us. Even though we're confused, just give us a confirmation. Show us the Father. And Jesus is like, haven't you guys seen the Father for the past three years? D don't you get who has been in me and who I've been working through and for? Haven't you seen me? And so this is the context of this teaching. Jesus is trying to explain to them what this first means and what it's all about. And so he says, hey, you will do the same works I've been doing. In fact, you will do greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Okay, so first off, as we try to unpackage this verse, who does this verse apply to? Very simply, and the thing that's easy to do is we take and we say, well, some verses are only for the apostles. And I think there are some verses that are only for the apostles, okay? But look at this verse. Who does this apply to? Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, that whoever, that anyone, that all of you guys that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, obviously this passage here applies to all believers, right? Okay. John chapter 6, verse 47, we're like, yeah, that applies to us, all right? Truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Okay, that applies to us. That fits. It's not just for the apostles. Uh, this one, John chapter 11, verse 25, I'm the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And he who lives and believes in me will never die. Applies to everyone. And the same goes true with John chapter 14, verse 12. And I tell you, anyone who believes in me, everyone that is a follower of mine. We, 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 can't, we can't brush this off and say, okay, this has no meaning for us. Because if we accept that John chapter 3 verse 16 has meaning for us. And John chapter 6 verse 47, then we got to also accept this. All right? And so again, this is one of those things where it's, 
it's easy to go by this passage and not really grasp it and understand it. And I struggled with teaching it because I haven't heard a lesson on it in the context of the churches I've been a part of. But this applies to us. And so I tell you the truth, anyone that believes in me means this is for everybody. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Okay, let's ask this question then. What, what are the works that Jesus has been doing up to this point? As you think about this, focus on this first statement here. Okay, I tell you the truth, anyone, as this obviously applies to us, believes in me, will do the same works I've done. All right, well, what's Jesus been doing? And our mind instantly goes to tracing back through the story of John. What's he done in John? Well, we got a story in John chapter 2 where he turns water into wine. Fascinating, okay? Uh, we got a story where he reads the mind of the Samaritan. It seems to be able to connect with her on a way that is a supernatural sort of knowledge. Um, we've got the story of an official son being healed in John chapter 4. We've got a man that's crippled in John chapter 5 for 38 years. He says, get up, and he jumps up and starts walking. All right? And then we got one of the most amazing stories. Jesus takes, you know, a value menu. He takes a lunchbox, and he feeds 5,000 people. And then, and then we got him walking on water. And last but not least, we've got him raising Lazarus from the dead. And so the question is, are you a little uncomfortable here? Okay, maybe, it's okay if you are, just give me some time. But my question is, is this what he's talking about? In order to be a believer, is it that we are supposed to do the works that Jesus is doing. Am I supposed to be able to feed 5,000 with Matt's lunchbox? Am I supposed to be able to walk on water in order to be a believer? And so that's, that's a valid question, but, but it's confusing and it's extremely hard to understand this. And so I want to look a little bit closer at it because a lot, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of Christians, or they say they're following Jesus, they take this passage, they rip it out and they misapply it and they abuse it. And so I want us to focus on what does this really mean? Let's start with what it can't mean. What it can't mean is found, because you can't just take one passage and not apply the rest of it, okay? I'm going to read this. It's not up here, but I want you to listen very carefully. There's no way that it can mean that we all, in order to be a follower of Jesus, have to do everything, every single thing that Jesus ever did, okay? And the reason why I know this is because 1 Corinthians chapter 12 clearly says there's different people with different gifts. Not all of Jesus' apostles had the same abilities to do what Jesus did. In fact, none of his apostles ever fed 5,000 and raised the dead and walked on water that we know of, okay? Definitely not all of them. It seems like those bigger stories would have been in there. Maybe maybe they skipped over them, I don't know. But according to spiritual gifts, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are some kinds... Of service, but the Lord gives them. There are different kinds of working, but all of them. Uh, there are different kinds of working, but in all of them, in everyone, is the same God at work. Now, to each, the manifestation of spirits given to the common good. To one's given a spirit of a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge. To uh, by the means of the same spirit. To another, faith. To another, a gift of healing. To another. Um, Miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. So it's obvious as you look at 1 Corinthians, this can't just mean that you are going to do the exact same things Jesus did even greater. Because this can't be limited to that, because according to 1 Corinthians, it's not tied to just the miraculous that Jesus did. So there's something else going on here. This works of Jesus as we think about it, has got to be something different than just his miracles. Now, and it may include his miracles, but it's got to be something broader than that because we know that not every believer has the same gifts as was attested to uh, by, by Paul in 1 Corinthians. So, okay, here's, here's the end. So if the miracles aren't what he's talking about, then what's Jesus' work? What did he come to do? I um, mean, just pause. I know this is kind of deep and heavy. What, what do we think of when we think of work? All right. Maybe, maybe some kids can help us because I don't want to overlook the obvious. So let's watch and see if you guys can maybe learn something from these little ones.
up, I want I want to be an architect. I want to go in the air. I want to be a pro baseball player. I want to be a veterinarian. And one more thing is to help people for the helicopter. A veterinarian and a paleontologist. Well, I want to be the same thing what my mom is. Mm, scientist and head of an earth factory. Librarian. I want to be a wildlife bi biologist. Some dinosaurs live in the water. A teacher. An architect. A football player. A tennis player. Police officer. Police Different. officer. I'm a dan I'm a ballerina princess singer, um, um, cheerleader. So that's what I want to be when I grow up. So you guys, you guys get when you we ask a kid, okay, what do you what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, what do you want to do? What do you want your life's work to be? Okay, this isn't a hard question. And so when you think of Jesus' life work, maybe it's maybe it's broader than the, the individual, the miraculous that we seem to focus on. Maybe it's something broader than that. What was Jesus about? What was his work? And there's a clue here in uh, John chapter fourteen, verse eleven. Okay, check this out. This is the verse right before it says, believe me when I say that I'm in the father, the father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. OK, so the the evidence of Jesus's works, what, what's the purpose of these? If, if you're questioning what I say. Then based on what I'm doing, based on the works that I do. That should show you that I'm from God. That, that should point you to God. That should show you the answer to the question about who am I? Because the works that I do prove that. Not just the miraculous, but everything that Jesus is about. Everything that Jesus is about reveals something about the Father. And so as you think about who Jesus is... What he did was a lot more than just walking on water feeding 5,000. It's how he treated people. People are amazed long before Jesus does anything miraculous by, by his teaching and by his wisdom. I mean, even as a kid, he's sitting there baffling scholars in the temple courts. And so as we look at this, the works of Jesus, the works of his entire life, they point toward this relationship with the Father. They, they, they move in the direction of showing that God is real and that his ways are being revealed and that he is who he claims to be. Here's another passage. Check this out. John chapter 10, verse 25. Jesus says, I did, I, I did tell you, but you did not believe. When he was asked, he was asked, hey, are you the Messiah? Just tell us plainly. That's what he was asked. He's like, I told you guys, but you don't believe. The works I do about my father in my father's name testify about me. What are the works? It, it, the works were including what he did that we would consider miraculous. But they are broader than that. Because how he treats the Samaritan woman is just as amazing in that culture as the fact that he reads her mind. Okay? So the works that Jesus did are a comprehensive thing about his life. John chapter 17, as he gets ready to finish, he says, hey, I have brought you glory on earth. By finishing the work he gave me to do. What, what's been Jesus' work? It's been everything about who he is. It's been the direction, the focus of his life has been his work. And so as you think about what is Jesus' work? Jesus' work is always pointing to the Father. What would be wrong with Jesus in the temptation? I mean, he fed 5,000 with a lunchbox. What's wrong with him making food? He's hungry. What's wrong with it is Jesus has the power, but it would be using what God has given him on himself in a self-serving, self-gratifying way instead of relying on God. And so even though he has the abilities, everything he does, miraculous, what we would consider non-miraculous, it's all pointing and focusing to God. And that is his life's work. That is who Jesus is, and that's what he came to do. 
And so when, when it says that we are going to do the work of Jesus, our life's work is going to be his life's work. We are going to point to the father. And that may mean that you are going to work a job where you are an electrician or you are a manager or you are a nurse or you are a teacher. But your life's work is not summed up by an occupation that you have. It sums up by the focus of your life. Your life's work is that you live to glorify and to point people to the realities of the Father. You live to show God's mercy and love to those that have a difficult time receiving it or believe that no one cares about them. That is our life's work. And that is what I believe it means when it says we are going to do the works of Jesus. So we don't, we don't work to climb the corporate ladder. We don't work to make more money. We're not trying to survive and just make another week so we can have a break on the weekend. We work to glorify God. And the things that we do point people toward God. That is what it means to be a Christian. And that is the work that we are called to do. Okay, so, so you understand God's work is not necessarily just limited to the miraculous. It, it's his life. And we are called into continuing that. When Jesus leaves, he says, hey, you guys are continuing my work. You're continuing what I want you to do. But in John chapter 12, look at this left part here. And this is where it gets really confusing. If that's true, what does this mean? I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works because I'm going to the Father. How do you, how do you deal with that? It's obvious that it applies to us all. What's the greater works? All right. And so we're going to talk about this. The first clue is actually found in the verse itself. Check this out. The limb part of it, something about these greater works is connected right after this. He says, hey, I'm going to the father because I'm going to the father. So something about, I think him going to the father, something about him going to the father is connected with these greater works. Now, now where's Jesus going after this? After this, he's about to be arrested. He's about to be crucified. He's about to be put into the grave to take on the battle with death, death itself that was first set up in the, in the garden. Okay? And so he's overcoming death and he's coming out of the grave and he's going back to be with Jesus. And this journey that he has has something to do with these greater works. And what happens at the end of this journey? The Holy Spirit comes. Before up to this time, nobody had the filling of the Holy Spirit in a way that every believer has it today. That's bold. You're telling me Elijah, who raised somebody from the dead, didn't have the same Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit as we have today. And according to Scripture, that's what it says. So this is an astonishing statement. Okay, check this out. Um, this is John chapter 20, verse 21. This is after Jesus comes back while he's on earth. This is what he says. This is a post-resurrection ex uh, experience. He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Okay, just stop right there. You hear what we've been saying? Jesus' work is to point people toward the Father. Now that he's leaving, the Father sends us. He sends his followers out. And they're going to continue that work. They're going to continue to point people to the Father with the work of their life, with the focus of their life. And then he tells them, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. His followers have the ability to declare whose sins are forgiven and whose aren't. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, so, so what, what's it meaning here? Okay, the difference in what happens after, post Jesus' ascension and before is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, according to John 16, verse 13, what, what's his role? He, he guides them into all truth. He helps them understand what the will of God is. And then they work. He also works as a counselor and a comforter and encourager. But, but never before in the history of the world is God's Spirit poured out on everybody. Acts chapter 2, quotation from Jeremiah, it says, hey, What's going to happen, what's going to be new in this new covenant is my spirit's poured out. I'll be with you. I will, I will go with you. 
And so this spirit gives people an understanding that we maybe have taken for granted all of our lives. That when the apostles pre-Jesus' ascension and get the Holy Spirit, they didn't even get all the pieces together. They hadn't figured it out. And, and how I know this is because in Acts chapter 1, they're still saying, Jesus, when are you going to restore your kingdom? And after that in Acts, they don't hear anything else about it. The earthly kingdom. They're, they're, they're preaching the kingdom. They, they connect the dots. It makes sense because the Spirit is showing them what it is that He's calling them to do. So the prophets of old do some amazing things, but they do not, did not have the understanding that we have today. No king of Israel understood what you and I understand today about God's plan of salvation, about who Jesus is. And so when we share about Jesus, when we tell someone and point them to God, we are, we are communicating to them something that's already happened. Jesus, when he said to someone, hey, I forgive you, I forgive your sins. He said this several times. He really forgave sins. I believe that. But he did it in anticipation of the price that was going to be paid for sins. When we say, hey, Jesus is offering you forgiveness of sins. It's based on something that's already happened in the past. It's based on something that's already done. And this is, this is greater this is greater than what they had access to before Jesus ascended and returned. And so, so we have a new level, a new depth of understanding when it comes to our relationship with Jesus and what he's done. And so as our life points toward Jesus, as we reflect and the decisions we make move people toward Jesus, we are proclaiming something that is even greater because we communicate everything to them. Jesus paid the price. Jesus died. Jesus rose to forgive your sins. Matthew chapter 11. This one of the passages kind of confirms this. What does this mean? Matthew chapter 11 verse 11. I tell you, among those born of women, no one has been raised greater than John the Baptist. Out of all the prophets, all the kings, no one's greater than John the Baptist. But the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Well, what, what does that mean? I think it goes along with this passage. That you and I, because of what we have access to now, can understand and communicate and offer something by pointing our lives to God that they never had the opportunity before to do before the New Testament. That we can communicate the full message of Jesus. And so as we think about this passage and what it means, as we believe and do greater things, we have the opportunity to be part of the work of God in communicating to people the complete and full plan that God intended. And when we say to someone, hey, I want you to know Jesus is taking away your sins. He's paid a price for you. We're not saying it based on what's going to happen one day. We're, we're saying it based on what's happened in the past. Because we understand what it is that Jesus has done. Because we've got the pieces put together. And so as we think about what it means, we are called to be a part of God's work today. To continue this idea of bringing a lost people into saving knowledge through a crucified Savior and Lord. And, and our work is not just to announce the kingdom of God is near. And that was really Jesus' initial sermon. That was his message. You go back early in Matthew. But we announce the kingdom of God is here. That it's here. That we have the opportunity to bring people into that kingdom. Out of the verses that I've heard, this is one that's been very confusing. But I hope at least you understand it's got to apply to us. And if it does, this is my best shot at what it means. Our lives are a continuation of Jesus' work. If you're not... If your life is not a continuation of Jesus' work in some way, are you following Jesus? A am I following Jesus? And so as we think about this, the question I want to leave you with is this. Are you involved, personally, vested in the greater works of Jesus? In carrying out his mission? In continuing to proclaim his message with the clarity and the knowledge that we have after understanding the New Testament? 
in bringing people that are lost into a relationship with Him? Are you involved in showing Jesus' compassion? Not just because He did it, but because what He's done in your life to someone who's undeserving. To offering forgiveness as Jesus does. Because these greater works that we have, this greater opportunity that we have, is something that is our life's work. And as we get down to the end of our life, I hadn't really thought a whole lot. Occasionally I do this with teens. I have them go out and, I, you know, we spend some time at cemetery. Okay, it's kind of creepy. But anyway, you guys understand. You had cemetery. Uh, but, but we have them write, look at epitaphs. We, we, we write down, okay, how are these people remembered? What's the phrase that remembered by? And as I think about, what, what's on your epitaph? You're, you're, you're passed away. How are you remembered by? Well, the dude was a nice guy. A good teacher. Because regardless of your occupation, your life is a lot brighter than that. And what I want to challenge you with is the idea of we've got to be about doing Jesus' works in order to be following Jesus. And so as you think about these greater works, are you a part of Jesus' greater working in carrying out the work of Jesus to every person today? If you are um, here tonight, or this morning, and you uh, have thought about and understood maybe a little more clearly than you have in the past what it means to follow Jesus, and you're ready to do that, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. We want you to be involved with us in the works that, that God has called us to in pointing people toward the Father. And if you are just been convicted this morning that, you know, I really feel like I need to be encouraged to get back to the work that I really think is important, then we want to pray for you on that. We want to lift you up in that. So I, I don't know what your, your need is. I don't know um, where you're at this morning. But I know that this verse is challenging, maybe even more so for us that have been in the church for a long time. It's challenging for me. And so if you have anything in your heart tonight, you can, or to this morning, you can talk to someone after service. You can pull me aside or you can come down front if you feel comfortable doing that. But we're just going to give you an opportunity now. Um, if you have something you need to express and let's lift up as a church family, we'll give you opportunities opportunity as we stand together and sing our imitation song.